we'll go ahead and let people in. Joshua, <clears throat> are you able to pull up, you're able to see the chat if people start doing anything in chat? No one's in there yet saying anything, yeah. but I can see it. Okay, I just want to make somebody, sure. Oh, that's Corey talking. <laughs> Thanks, just Corey. put something in it so you can see it. Yeah, I know you'll do great. Are we uh, Are we good? Should I start, try to start letting people in? <clears throat> yes, please. I'm going to okay. go ahead and start the music. Boy, I can't get that to catch. There we go. Oops. Is your audio shared, Dana? Oh, it might not be. Well, then let's not worry about music today. Thanks, Seth, for prompting that. I can hear it, Dana. You can hear it? I can it? hear the music. Okay. Okay. Then I'll go ahead and play it. I'm not sure I clicked the audio share button, Seth. So if it's kind of low, I'll, I'm not, but that's a good thing for me to know for next time. I just want to welcome folks. I know folks are coming in from the waiting room and you hear us just doing a little final troubleshooting. Um, you've got about four, let's see, about four more minutes till we get started. So grab your lunch or finish up that last contact note and then we will get started right at noon. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I just want to welcome you. I see we've got folks coming in from the waiting room, which is wonderful. Um, we're going to get started in about two and a half minutes or so, right at noon. Um, if you want to go ahead and type into chat and just say hi and let us know where you're from and um, maybe what your role is, tell us something you like about fall. Um, feel free to type, type that into chat just so we can see who's joining us. Thanks, Corey. Corey got us started. I know one of the things that I am liking now is the weather cooling down. Like I'm a super fan of summer and I could live in summer all the time, but it's a little nice to be able to take a walk in the morning with my dog and it's um, kind of cooling down. I see Susanna is from Indiana. So I'm wondering what it's like for you there, Susanna. Is it cooling down there where you are? Um, hi, Joanne. Joanne's from Goochland. Lisa likes boots and boot sock season. Yeah, that's nice. I don't have any boots, Lisa. We got to go shopping. I more have like, I like jean weather, blue jean weather and something nice and cozy. That's great. Good. I see Angie and Angelina joining us. Shopping trip. Yeah, we need a team shopping trip. That sounds good. Rebecca is also from Indiana. She loves the changing leaves and scented candles. Rebecca, everywhere I go looking at candles, it's pumpkin spice, pumpkin spice everywhere. That is the, that's the, become the fall smell. I don't know, Joe, I saw your mouth move and you might be muted, but you are welcome to jump in. I we have several people from Indiana. Angie says she loves wearing sweatshirts. And Cecilia from Fairfax, wonderful. It's so awesome to see how many folks we have joining us from Indiana, how cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Christina. You guys, as y'all, as people are coming in the waiting room, we have about one more minute. And folks are just typing into chat to let us know where they are, something they like about fall. We're just touching base. Romney here is from Southwest Virginia. Wonderful. And Tony likes fluffy pajamas. That's a really good one. Um, folks from Loudoun, <clears throat> Joshan says loves the weather. Joyce is fall fashion for her. Then Joy, you and Lisa need to connect, right? Liz loves the leaves and the cooler weather. Yeah, Liz, where I moved into this new neighborhood and there's like no trees. So I passed one and there's like three orange leaves on it. And I was like, oh, it's fall, <laughs> my tiny little tree. Uh, Our Newton says love wearing hoodies, drinking coffee, all that stuff that warms you up. Julie likes going to the pumpkin patch. Welcome, Julie. Julie's from Ohio. Kay Adams says outdoor fires and hot cider. Yeah, all that good stuff to get us warm. Yes. 
Dee is heading to the coast for surf and fishing. That sounds nice. Brittany loves the leaves changing too. Yeah, I saw your comment, Corey. I know that's something you like. I'll tell you guys, when I lived in England, they, they would say, oh, we love the fall colors, the fall colors and where we were, all the trees turned yellow and then they all fell off the trees. And I was like, you have not seen fall colors till you've been to the Shenandoah Valley where you see all of the beautiful oranges and reds and purples and it's the best ever. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Joe and I are from the same area of Virginia. We live in the similar area and came from central Virginia. So we had a lot of those fall colors where we both grew up. We have some from Shelbyville, North Carolina, wonderful. All right, well, you guys, I see that it is noon. So if I can get some music to stop. I know we still have folks coming in and that is wonderful. You guys keep typing in chat, letting us know who you are, where, you know, where you're from and something you love about fall. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. So um, we're gonna get the recording started. And um, so, you know, this is being recorded, but I wanna welcome you all to our October, our fall service coordination chat. Um, the chat today, we, we hope to have a conversation with you. We'll be having a conversation back and forth with Joe Sherlon and I talking about building those relationships with families from the very first contacts, the very first visits. So we want you to be thinking about what do you do before you ring the doorbell or before you get to the door? And then what do you do after you're at the door or after you're in that virtual meeting to try to build those relationships to start things off on the right foot for our families as they come into the early dementia program? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so my name is Dana Childress. I work as one with the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I'm one of our state's um, early intervention professional development consultants, so I'm on our training team that su supports our practitioners in Virginia. Um, I am delighted to have Joe Sherlon Capehart here with me, and I'm going to introduce Joe Sherlon a little more thoroughly in just a second. Um, one thing I wanted to call your attention to is you do have access to closed captioning and transcripts if that is something that would help you. Um, to know where that is, you're going to hover your cursor at the bottom of your screen where you'll see your vertical toolbar appear or your horizontal toolbar. Look for the CC or the, um, I believe it says a live transcript. Click that button and then you can either click view subtitle to make your, the um, captions appear at the bottom of your screen or you can view the full transcript which will open it up. I believe it's to the left of, to the right of your screen. So know that you have access to turn those on and off as, as you see fit. All right. So as I said, I'm happy to have Joe Sherlon here with me. Joe Sherlon Capehart is a service coordinator with lots of experience. I'm um, Joe <clears> Sherlon, <throat> one person that I love, is like a, one of my favorite service coordinators, a go-to person for me. And like she has said, when she and I get to talking, it could last a long time. So we will try to keep it to our hour today. Um, Joe Shalon has been a service coordinator for 13 years. She's in the, with the Infant and Toddler Connection of Norfolk, um, but she's been um, working with families for more than 20 years. She is a master coach in Virginia, and I remember when we were having our master coach training, we didn't have tons of service coordinators mm -hmm. going through the process. So she's got some specialized knowledge there and has been a great support in helping others use the coaching approach. Um, she's passionate about advocating and supporting families, and she says working in the community provides her with the opportunity to merge two of the things she loves the best, communication and people. So we're happy to have her communicating to our people today. Um, and there's my information there. So welcome, Joe. I'm really happy to have you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited about being here today. Wonderful. Well, we are gonna jump right in and you guys know that you have, thank you, Lisa, for putting the directions for the closed captioning in chat. We hope that you will use chat today to ask questions, to make comments and to share what works for you when you're building relationships with families from those first visits. So we wanna have a conversation with you using the chat today as well. So first thing we're gonna do is find out a little bit more about you. So Seth is gonna pull up a poll. We have two of them. Um, so you'll see a poll window appear on your screen. Um, you just answer. The first poll here is how long have you been a service coordinator? Just click your option. Um, we'll give you a little bit of time to do that. If you are not an active in the position of a service coordinator right now, you can let us know in chat, how long have you been working with service coordinators? And you can let us know your role in chat as well. So I'm gonna to pause to give folks a chance to answer. Mm -hmm. 
So some answers are still coming in. They're slowing down now. So and remember that you can always, if you have any trouble with the poll, you can type your answer into chat or let us know if you're in a different role. And we can go ahead and end the poll, Seth, and publish it. That would be great. All right, so it looks like we have about 35% of our folks are more than 10 years, like Joe Shirlana. I was a service coordinator for about 15 years a, a while ago. Um, but we have people really in all the different ranges, Joe. You can see um, kind of the whole gamut, which I think is great. And today, I think whether you've been doing this for 10 mm -hmm. minutes or 10 years, I think, I hope that with our conversation today, you'll find some nuggets of things for you to try, things to think about. And we definitely want to tap into the expertise of folks on our call today to have that information showing up in chat. So I'm going to visit chat here. It looks like um, we have Karen is a physical therapist about 25 years. Um, uh, let's see, Danielle says she, she was had worked with service coordinators for over five years. We have Dee. Hey, Dee, a um, local system manager, and she's in a dual role as a service coordinator too. Dee, I'm not sure I knew that, so that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and we have Robin here from New Path, um, so that's wonderful. So she's working with our families. So let's go ahead. You guys can X out of that poll. So look at the top of the poll window where <coughs> you will see a little X. Go ahead and close it. Now Seth is going to open up a new poll for us where we want to find out about the, the role of the service coordinators who have joined us. So for those of you that are service coordinators, I want to know whether you're in a blended or a dedicated role. Blended means you're a service coordinator and another service provider. Dedicated means you're only in a service coordinator role. I don't actually love that label. That's a label from the literature. I think you guys are probably all dedicated. But dedicated here means that you are a service coordination only role. And I think, Joe, you are a, a dedicated service coordinator, right? I am. I'm a dedicated service coordinator. In many ways, right? In um, many ways. When I was practicing service coordination, most of the time I was in a blended role as a service coordinator and um, developmental service provider. I'm always in awe of people that can do, um, you know, that that have the blended role because there's so many additional things to do with so much responsibility in addition to all that you do as a service coordinator as well. Yeah, it's a juggle. I think there's so there's, you know, things that are challenging probably about both roles and things that are great about it. Um, I, I, I loved it, but I, I, and so I also thought the folks that are in the dedicated role that have those really high numbers of families they're seeing, you know, 60, 80 families, that's a challenge that I've sort of admired because people can still do it really well, even when they have those high numbers. So yes. yeah, there's, there's challenges and, and wonderful things all around. Well, Seth, if you don't mind ending the poll and publishing so everybody can see. Wonderful. So we actually have 77% of folks in a service coordinator only role. That's interesting. And about 23% of people in a blended role. All right. Well, thank you guys. We were just curious about where that landed for you. Like you said, we're going to really talk about the service coordinator role. So we're, we're, wherever you are, whether that's the, the primary way you spend your time or you also balance that with being a provider, what we're going to talk about today is relevant to both. Absolutely. So again, you'll just X out of that poll, look at the top of the poll window, click the X on your screen to close the poll. And we're gonna jump in to um, get to get to talking. So before we dive into our conversation, we wanted to draw your attention to what really um, is a place to go for recommended practices and guidance for service coordinators. Hopefully you've heard about um, the relatively new, it was just launched last December, Service Coordination and Early Intervention Joint Position Statement. So this position statement, and full disclosure, I was on the writing team, so I'm a big fan of this statement, um, but we, we, this was a position statement that was a joint effort through the Division of Early Childhood of the Council for Exceptional Children and the IDEA Infant and Toddler Coordinators Association. So our, and the Infant and Toddler Coordinators Association includes all of the state level Part C coordinators in the, um, across the country who've really committed to elevating the importance of service coordination. It looks like we've got somebody getting a little creative on the slide with their red pin. So I don't know, Seth or Lisa, if you guys can go ahead and erase that for me, that would be wonderful. Um, if you're playing around with the tools, know that your way out of the tools is just to click the cursor button, which is usually at the far uh, left end of that toolbar if you open up the annotation tools. So in the position statement on page eight, you'll see this, um, this statement, and I think it grounds us today. So service coordinators have a variety of roles and responsibilities throughout the early intervention process, many of which are grounded in the shared partnership with the family. 
The partnership begins with the first contacts with the family and continues throughout through the child's exit from the system. So today that's where we are grounding today is how to build that shared partnership from the very beginning. And Lisa has dropped links into chat um, so that you have access if you wanna take a look at the position statement, the full statement, or you wanna see the shorter executive summary just to kind of whet your appetite and maybe share those with other service coordinators and others in your network. All right, well, with that said, let's go ahead and get our conversation going. So today we're talking about making those first visits with families. So some programs might call those intakes or first visits. You know, you might have a different label for those. Whatever, whatever you call that first time you meet with families, it's preceded by some kind of contact, right? Sometimes it's like our image here on the screen where you get a call on your work line or your cell phone and you don't even know who it is and you pick it up. And that's a referral or a family calling for information. So it also could be that you receive the referral and you're making a first call to the family. So you at least know a little bit about them. But wherever you are, that first contact is a really important opportunity to lay the groundwork. So I would love for you guys to answer in chat, how do you lay the groundwork for your relationship and help the family begin to understand how EI works? Because EI is a pretty complicated system, right? So type into chat for me and let me know what are, what are the things that you guys do. As you're beginning to type, I'm gonna throw this to Jo Sherlon so she can get us started thinking about what this looks like for her. Well, you know, I think um, the first thing, the statement that we just talked about, the service coordination statement, um, the word partnership, that is a word that sticks out to me. And I think that when we begin to lay the groundwork for building that relationship, I think that is the first thing that we have to think about. We have to think about that it is a partnership between our program, our services, and the family. And so the first thing, in, and, and I know everybody's process is different, but in Norfolk, we have a referral coordinator. And that referral coordinator speaks with the family first. They gather all the information and then everything is sent over to us. So as the service coordinator speaking with the family for the first time, I use that word partnership a lot to let them know that this is a partnership. Something that I sometimes say to the family is we're all on a bus, right? And we're kind of going along for the ride as providers, as service coordinators, but that the family is driving the bus. And I use that often because I want them to know that they are in control of what happens with their family and what happens with their child. So that's the first thing that I do as far as laying that groundwork to let them know that we are not in charge, that we are along for the ride to kind of help them and to guide them, but that they are driving and they're kind of letting us know where we're going to go. It's always important to set the tone and to first let the family know what early intervention is. Families are often thrown into early intervention by other family members and by other professionals, but they don't often really understand what they're getting into. And so, um, you know, I start by explaining what early intervention is, how we started, what our purpose is, and how we can support them and how we can help them. So really using some of those key words like support, partnership, um, relationships, it helps me to build that, you know, to start that relationship and to lay that foundation. So we kind of go through um, um, how are you eligible for our program? What does eligibility look like? Uh, what are all the things that we're, you know, that we're talking about? Because some families come in and they're only concerned about communication. And so that's kind of all that they want to focus on. So we talk through all of the areas that we're looking at, that we're assessing so that families can understand that every development kind of works together. And so we're, we're taking a look at everything. Um, so we kind of ease their mind that way to let them know. Um, and so really, and I take the time to really listen because we give so much information during that first encounter that oftentimes we don't take the opportunity to really listen to them. And so as I'm building that groundwork, I'm asking them what's important to them. And even though I have the information, you know, on my screen, I give them the opportunity to share so that I can really understand um, so that they can know that we're really, we're really listening, that we are really, uh, we're concerned 
and that we really want to help. Because, you know, you go to doctor's visits and things like that, and they're just throwing so much information, and families don't get the opportunity to share. And so it's important that we use those um, we use those keywords and that we listen during that first encounter. And I, I feel like that's how we build the groundwork for a relationship. Yeah, I, I love what you said about the partnership and, and helping families even understand that's what we're here for. Because how it's pretty, I think, pretty scary, pretty intimidating to be meeting with somebody you've never met with before, entering a system you don't know about. And it's you're all there to talk about the thing that the parent loves the most and is probably the most concerned about. So it's a time of vulnerability. So I love the idea of softening that process. So the family knows I loved your bus analogy, like you're in the driver's seat, but I'm here to help and support you. There's lots of stuff in chat, Joe, that's going right along with what you said. I love Lily said, Hey, Lily um, said, spending time listening to their family story. So just like you were talking about that importance of listening, looks like folks are saying things like, providing contact information, introducing themselves. Joanne says, I think like you were talking about too, Joe, striking a balance between sharing information and gathering information from them and letting them talk about their child. Um, Beatrice is asking them what they know, lots of good information. You guys should be scrolling through chat too, lots of good tips mm -hmm. in here sharing information about how the program works. Um, in air says, emphasizing that we are a team. And I love that idea from the beginning, letting the parent know you're an equal and valued team member. So I think what you were talking about with that partnership is right aligned with that. Um, Liz says, find out what's going on in the family's words, ask about the referral, establish expectations, LaShonda says. Um, find out what the family knows about the program. Um, yeah, Nanette says, this is the first introduction to the EI process. So we want to talk with them about how that works, how we work as a team, how I'm there to coordinate that first session. So I noticed that, thanks, Nanette. Several people said, Jocelyn, they explained the role of the service coordinator. I think that's really important, too. I, I'm wondering, does that come up for you when you explain to them about the bus, like how, how your role falls into that? It does. I always explain what my role is because... Um, you know, you're and the word that I use when I'm talking about the role of a service coordinator is an advocate, right? Because that's what families want. They want someone that's going to support them and also advocate for them. And I noticed a lot of people in the chat were saying, you know, ask about what do you know about early intervention? Because there are families who, as soon as they are referred, they, you know, they go right to researching to figure out, you know, what is early intervention. And then there's some families that aren't there yet. And so, you know, they don't know a lot, but I do like that as well. Explaining your role as a service coordinator, how you're there to support, how you're there to advocate, because then they feel like they have someone that's holding their hand and there's someone that's there just for them. And also asking them, what do you know about service coordination? Because sometimes it helps you not to have to be so wordy or not to have to talk so much. And it gives you that additional time to listen because some families really do know a lot. Um, and it kind of helps you to learn like how, where to take the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. And also it helps you to learn what families are really ready for, because some families are just ready for the basics of what is early intervention? What are we going to do? How can we support? And then there's other families who are really ready to go kind of like that extra mile mm -hmm. and to get extra information that you may usually share later, but they're ready for it now. It also helps them to know that you're knowledgeable. Because no yeah. one wants to work with someone, like you said, it's their, you know, it's their child, it's the person that they love the most. And so making sure that they know that you're knowledgeable about this whole process, that helps as well. So just being able to answer those questions. And so that's why it's so important as well, you know, to read the program manual, um, you know, to be, to know what the process is for the intake, so that when families are asking questions that you're knowledgeable about it, because they need to know that the person that's holding their hand and walking them through are able to give them good information. And I'll say this, it may be off topic, but if we don't know, also being humble enough and honorable enough to say, I don't know, but I will find out and not just giving, you know, information just to answer questions. So that's important too, in really building that groundwork. When you're honest with them and you tell them you don't know, but you will find out that is something that really builds that foundation for a relationship with them. I think so, because it gives them the permission to not know too. Like you come in, you don't know, but you always circle back and you find the answer and you supply that answer. 
And then they know that they can trust you. It builds trust at the beginning. Um, I, I liked what you said and what others said in the chat too about explaining that role because I think families can come into this first contact and they have a picture in their head of what a physical therapist does. And maybe they have an assumption about what a speech language pathologist does, but the role of a service coordinator is really unique to what we do. And it's not the same as a case manager. So, which might be a point of reference for them. So helping them understand that and using that phrase. So they identify that with you, super important. I see other folks adding to the conversation. Cecilia says she doesn't like seeing herself so much as an advocate. She uses the word resource that supports the needs and helps them navigate the program. So I think Cecilia, we're right along on the same page, that resource, mm -hmm. that support, guiding families. And eventually, yeah, we're advocates, but helping them learn to advocate for themselves. That's a great skill to encourage in families, especially because they're only gonna be in early intervention for a brief amount of time. And you know what, um, just to talk about that too, and I think that's the, imp that's the importance um, of being a service coordinator. Like we all know where we are, you know, and when we go through this process of working with families, you know, so if we call ourselves an advocate, if we call ourselves a resource, you know, we have to give ourselves, you know, that label. We have to know where we are and it's gonna be different for each family. Yeah. You know, there's gonna be some family that's gonna come in and they're not gonna be as strong. So we're gonna to have to help them to advocate and in being able to advocate when they do transition from our program, that's a skill, you know, that they have learned from us that it's okay to advocate for yourself and to advocate for your child. And then being that resource, you know, we're teaching them because if we're coaching, right? We're walking them through how yeah. to get to resources and use resources. And so Cecilia, I think that's absolutely right. Kind of like knowing who we are and what we are for each family. And it may be different and we have to do it the way that we're comfortable because we're going to talk about a little later with us just kind of being ourselves and with us being ourselves and being true to who we are. That's how yeah. we're going to be able to support our families. So yeah. I like that, Cecilia. I do too. And I think I truly believe service, it's just as important to individualize service coordination as it is to individualize any of the other services. So I think that's Absolutely, what we both are talking about. Well, let's go ahead and talk about um, that. So we've talked about kind of that first contact. Now let's talk about what that first visit looks like. And so Joe, feel free to show it, throw in if you want to talk about what you do to prepare. But let's think about like what happens on that first visit, whether that's, we're kind of leaning towards like an intake visit, whatever that first session is with families and how you build rapport, provide information, and gather information from families. So you guys type into chat and let us know. You might have touched on it in the chat already, but if there are particular strategies you guys use to build rapport, provide, and gather information from families, we'd love to hear about them in the chat. So how does that work? How does that first visit work for you, Joshuan? So the first thing I want to say about the first visit is make sure that you know about your family and you know about the child. It's always important to make sure that you know the parent's name. Make sure that you know the child's name. You know, oftentimes as service coordinators where it's a hustle and bustle and we're, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to gather information in between visits or in between what we're doing. But it's very important that when you go on that first visit, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual, that you know that information. Even if you have to put it on a sticky, you know, on your computer or on your folder, but you should know um, the child's name, the parent's name, and most importantly, you should know what the concerns are, right? Because that's going to kind of um, set the foundation for how you start your conversation, really knowing what the concerns concerns are. So you want to know where the referral came from. You want to know, you know, kind of if the parents have concerns, you want to have all those things kind of really ready for you because you don't, it's supposed to be individualized and you don't want the family to think that you don't know about their family. When you see them, it's all about them for that one hour or those two hours, those, that time belongs to them. And so you want to have that information. The other thing is make sure that you are familiar with your process so that you are not spending so much time focusing on your computer. You know, sometimes, you know, you have your computer and we know that we have to get the work done. We know we have to get everything in. So we spend so much time focus on the laptop and focus on the paperwork, but try to be familiar with your material so that you don't need to read those documents and you can focus on the family um, 
So maybe as your as you know as your plan with little Susie, you know I know it's a little different because of COVID, but you know pre COVID we were able to do a lot of those hands on, and so as you're you know you're talking to mom, you're able to give her eye contact. Or talking to dad, then you can really you know you can give them eye contact. If you're playing with the ball with Susie, then you can still you know be sharing information about the program. So you really want to be prepared um, in that way. You wanna make sure with that um, first visit, you're asking open-ended questions, right? That's gonna um, give the parent the opportunity to be able to talk and share. I know as we've been talking about coaching, you know, we talk about the difference between those yes and no questions and then those open-ended, because then we'll leave the visit and say, well, mom didn't say a lot. Well, if we're asking yes and no questions, then it's not giving them the opportunity to do that. So really try to ask those open-ended questions that is going to be able to um, allow us to have a conversation. Because when we're allowing them to have a conversation, they're going to give us information that we won't otherwise know, right? And so we don't, so I think that's really important. Um, use good communication skills. We've already talked about the eye contact, but think about, you know, your tone of voice. Think about um, your body language, you know, think about, um, you know, just consider like those cultural things, just all those things. You want to be aware of all those things before the visit. And the most important thing is I always ask questions about the family. We have to remember that it's an individual family service plan. And so although we are providing services and supports for that child based on you know, what that concern is for them, but we're also working with the family. And I think when we start to ask mom and dad, like, I don't know, what do you, you know, what do you like to do? Um, you know, what other concerns do you have about your family? It helps them to open up and it helps them to know that we care. So although that first meeting is really, um, you know, it's information gathering, but you have to remember, it's not just you giving them information. It's important that you get information from them. So I know I've said it before, so it's kind of like I'm repeating it, but it's important to allow the family to talk freely. And even if you don't get all of your information out there, that's okay, because if you have set the tone, if you have set the foundation, and when you leave that home, they're comfortable with you, then you're going to get that opportunity to go back and share the rest of what you need, or you're going to get that opportunity to have a phone call to make sure that you share everything that they need to know, but just really giving them the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, I'm gonna jump in, Joe Sean, because I think what was something you said at the beginning or earlier connects to this, like it's so easy to sort of get lost in hiding behind our computer, typing up all the notes, making sure you're checking everything, you're getting all the, the history and checking about documentation. But I love it how you talked about um, making sure they have time to share. It's like that balance between them sharing and you getting what you need. There was a, a suggestion in chat about, and um, let's see who from C. Kramer about preparing documentation as much as possible ahead of time. I think that's a great strategy so that you can get that balance. As much as you can prep ahead of time, this gives you more time to, to build that rapport with the family. So I, I, I loved what you said and I thought that's another great strategy. And you know, it's so much, um, you know, just thinking about how, um, you know, the service coordinators and how much experience, you know, when we're doing the poll, it's so much knowledge in this room, you know, yeah. and although we're doing things different ways, we're all getting to the, the ending is the same, you know, being able to support the family um, and just kind of reading through, I think everybody's doing the same thing. They're asking families, you know, what's important to them. They're, you know, they're, they, they know the information before they get there and we're giving families the opportunity to share. And Absolutely. so I think that's so important. I that's do too. And so I think important. you made a great point too about, I think service coordinators can feel some stress on that first visit to get it all done, to get all those release forms signed and get all the information to the family. So building that rapport, if you have to follow up later with a phone call or a, you know, te Microsoft Teams meeting or whatever to gather a little bit more information, what's really important is figuring out that balance, but building that rapport early on. And I see Joy is agreeing. Yes, one of your people from Norfolk, they're asking questions about the family to get to know them and what they expect is really helpful. It shows you're interested, you're hearing them and you care. Thanks, Joy. 
Well, I'm curious, Joe, let's talk about, these are such great uh, ideas and I'm thinking they're probably similar when you were working in a virtual platform, when you were doing these first visits with your families during the pandemic, primarily all virtually, right? Um, I know many programs are doing a mixture of virtual and in-person. Some might've been leaning more towards being back in person, face to face. But I'm curious, did you do have to do anything differently over the last year when you were building the relationship with the family over a virtual platform? I mean, you mentioned it just a bit when you were trying to talk about relating to the family and getting the, the you know, the typed up stuff on the laptop. But what, how was that for you this last year when you were working virtually? You know, and some people may or may not agree, but I've shared it with you know our team in Norfolk. I have actually, you know, I missed the, you know, I missed, I really missed the hands on, you know, with the families and going into the home. But I think what has happened for me um, with the virtual platform, it has really allowed me not to focus so much on the paperwork because, you know, like you said, we talked about before you get in there and it's just like all about the paperwork. But with, you know, the, the family know, okay, we're going to do paperwork, you know, with our service coordinator but it takes, it's not the, it's not the main focus. And so I feel like I've been able to have conversations with families virtually that I may not be able to have in person because I'm so focused on the paperwork. Um, and I also think that now that we have been virtual, that families aren't connecting service coordinators with just the paperwork. You know how sometimes you'll have the provider say, oh, the service coordinator is going to come out to our next visit because we have to do paperwork. Yeah. Right. And so they're thinking, oh, you know, Joe Shalom's coming because we have to do paperwork and get things signed. But yep. with virtual, it's like Joe Shalom's calling because she's interested in what's happening. She wants to check in on services. She wants to check in on me. She wants to see about, you know, how the baby's doing. And so I feel like we're able just to have those real conversations. And although I'm still working, and yes, I'm doing some of these things because we have to do it. I have to know, you know, when was the last time the baby went to the doctor? Um, you know, we're checking up on, well, you know, weight gain or specialty visits, or we're checking up on insurance. But it made it seem so much bigger than just that. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had families that said, you know, even though I haven't met you in person, like, I feel like we're family. I feel like we have, a, you know, such a good relationship. And it's because I feel like we're just not focused on that paper. Joe Shalon's not coming just to do paperwork, you know, yeah. and we're talking on the phone. And so it's really been helpful for me doing it virtual to be able to really build those relationships. And so now that we're starting to go back in the home, the foundation is already laid. So when I walk in the, you know, when I walk in the home, they're excited to see me in person. Um, of course, the baby's looking like, I think I've seen that person. I think I've heard that voice, <laughs> but it has really, you know, built that relationship with the parent because it wasn't just about paperwork. And not saying that it's always just about paperwork, but, you know, depending on what system you're in, you only get the opportunity to go to the family's home because you have to get the paperwork. You know, in Norfolk, we go all the time. Yeah. You know, I think we kind of pride ourselves in being able to do that. But this kind of gave me a different outlook of saying, you know, the paperwork is important, but that's kind of secondary. You know, you want your families to trust you. You want to build that relationship. And I think that's what it has done for me. And okay. it's the importance of like really being able to check in and have a really good check in. And so sometimes over the phone, you can talk about everything. Whereas if you're in the home, it's like, okay, I only have this amount of time. And then I have to jump in my car and I have to drive across town to get to another family. But just being able to do it virtually and say, I can talk to this family 15 more minutes because I don't have to drive anywhere. I don't have to pack up. So yeah. I think it's been really good for me. I hope it's been good for other service coordinators and other programs. And I think it's been good for, um, it's been good for teams, right? For us as a team, because I think, you know, as a team, you start to really think about what's important. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? And then it's like, Paperwork is important, but building this relationship that is, you know, that's at the, that's a priority is at the top of our list. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it occurred to me while you were talking is how important it is for all the team members, family and the other team members to really understand the role of the service coordinator. 
because paperwork and getting the prior notice signed and the IFSP review form signed, all that stuff, you guys, service coordinators, manage that. But we do want to make sure all of our other team members know that's a part of your job. That's a really important part of your job. But checking in and making sure you understand really how the family is doing, not just that they signed off on the document. Like you said, super priority too. And you guys type into chat and let us know if there's anything you guys have had to do differently working from a virtual platform. Nanette um, makes a neat, a neat point that sometimes there are some great things you observe and you want to capture that and be sure to, to include it. So if you've got that prep time done, you have more space to do observation. And I know observation kind of worked a little differently from the virtual platform. Some people felt like they got to see lots more things because families would just pick them up and take them around the house and others felt like I only got to see what was in you know whatever view I had from this little corner or this little screen but see mm -hmm. Nanette says the virtual does allow me to see the child in the natural environment even more so okay because when in the home the child may take time to warm up each visit or hide or act differently she feels like there's been times when she's been able to see to get into the virtual visit the parent puts the camera on the child is doing things that they wouldn't do if someone was there such a good point you maybe get to see a little more authentically what the family interactions are like because your presence hasn't changed the the interaction mm -hmm. and that's really good i like that she said that because you know sometimes you do see things that you wouldn't see because sometimes the child doesn't you know there's always that you know that kid that is like they see the camera and they're like running to it but yeah. There's also those families that children are just kind of like playing and just kind of doing their thing and they don't realize that we're there and we yeah. do get the opportunity to do that. Yeah, um, I see Lorelai says um, kind of it's a little more cleaner. She did an in-person visit this morning and the parents spent a lot of time redirecting the child away from her her device. <laughs> Forgotten that happens yeah. after all these months. Yeah, it does. <laughs> And then Cecilia said that helping the family to position the camera is important to get a best picture. And that's, you know, that's absolutely, I, sometimes I'll tell my families, you know, I don't have to see you either, mom, just kind of put the camera so that we can kind of see, you know, how your child is playing and what you guys usually do. And it does, it takes the pressure off of it because of um, the child doesn't feel like they're having to perform. They're just doing what they would naturally do. Yeah, um, I think Alexis, I'm trying to look up, but um, I think Alexis said um, virtual has helped families who started this way get a better vision for coaching um, and it makes it easy for the providers to coach. And I think that's really important, too. I think we talked about that before, too, but it does because coaching has been we've been doing coaching a long time in Virginia, but I think it's been hard for some providers. And so being able to do it over, you know, virtual visits. I think it's made it easier for them as they have they have transitioned back into the home because it's just the expectation that parents aren't, you know, they're not looking for the hands on, you know, as much as they were before. Yeah, so it's going to be so interesting to see how this last year and a half changes our field. I do think there's going to be some permanent positive changes. Um, yeah, Joyce says, has showed families that we're in this together, we're all doing the best we can. And I think uh, some other folks commented about that increased parent engagement. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and move to our next question. Um, so most of these initial visits go really smoothly, right? Most of them go smoothly. Most of them, you start building that rapport and it feels like a positive experience for everyone. But we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that there are challenging situations that service coordinators face um, with building that initial relationship and, and challenging situations you might find yourself in. Um, so when we were planning for this web discussion, we some of the challenges that came up were working with families, maybe a family who is um, has come to your program and didn't choose to come there, has been referred maybe by Child Protective Services, or maybe there are substance abuse or mental health challenges that the family is facing. And while we, we show respect for all families, right, and we want to um, work with them and support them, there are some situations you go into that are more challenging for you as a service coordinator. So I'm wondering, I'd love for you guys to add into chat your thoughts about this, but Joe Shalon, I'm wondering, any thoughts you have about how you build a relationship with a family who's in a challenging situation? And you know, I think one of the challenging situations that we encounter in early intervention is usually CPS. So, yeah. you know, Child Protective Services, that's one of the things that I know, you know, most of us have, you know, we have encountered. And, you know, as we were talking about this, Dana, we were just thinking about, we were talking about the first thing is to really acknowledge 
the situation that the family is in. Yeah. You know, we have to acknowledge that, you know, we know they're kind of in a tight spot. Um, you know, most of us who have worked in early intervention, we've never had our children removed, you know, from our families. And so we don't really know how it feels, but really acknowledging that they are in this situation um, is very important. And then I think that's also an important time to explain the role of the service coordinator again. I know for myself, I always let families know that we that I am not a part of human services. I am not a part of CPS. And so personally, I think it's important to, to make that separation so that they don't think that everybody's just kind of coming together, you know, against them, that, you know, human services has their role and early intervention, we have our role. Yes. And so, and we have to be honest as well. So I always let families know. So we are mandated reporters. And so if there is a concern, you know, we have to do what's in the best interest of the child. And so I have to make a report, but that is not my intentions. That is not my goal, um, walking into your home or you coming into our office for this, you know, for this visit. Our goal is to support you. And so, you know, I let them know that we're going to support you. I'm always honest about it. Um, and I let them know that sometimes, even though it may not be right, but sometimes having another professional to support them and advocate on their behalf, that that's going to be helpful. And I also let them know that there may not be any concerns, that it's procedure for, you know, if a child is removed from the home, that they make the recommendation for early intervention and that we're going to do an assessment. And if there are any concerns, then we're going to be able to write that report for them. We're going to be able to, you know, let human services know. And so that's just the part that they're going to be able to check off to help them to get to the end of the process. And so that's always been beneficial for me with sharing that information that um, I think, like Cecilia said, and that is when I use the word, we're going to be a resource for you. Yeah. Right. And then also, if there are some concerns then I'm, we're going to be able to help you get services in place that we are going to be able to support your family, get you the services that you need, help you make those connections. And again, that's something else that you're going to be able to check off to help you to get to the end of the process so that human services will know that you're doing what you need to do and you're making the best decisions you know, for your child. So I'm always honest. And I'm always encouraging. And I think, again, it's about using those keywords. It's a partnership. I'm a resource. I'm an advocate for you. And we're going to help you along the way. And oftentimes, you know, that helps families. And even when they're out of CPS services, they will continue with our services because they do feel like they had that support. Um, and another thing, you know, make sure you're not looking down on those families. We don't yeah. know where we're going to find ourselves, you know, later on in life. And mm -hmm. so making sure that we're treating them the way that we treat all of our families, that they're not any different. They're in a different situation, but we don't know where we will find ourselves or someone that we love may find themselves. And so always just giving them the same level of respect the yeah. same level of service that we're giving everyone else. They're just in a hard spot. And then, you know, sometimes there's substance abuse and there's other things where families don't know where those resources are. And so then again, we remember that we're not there just to support the child, but this is where we start to look into other resources and we coach them through, you know, where they can go to get support for themselves so that the, at the end, because they're not going to be with us forever, but that at the end, they're a healthy family. Yeah. Oh, I love the way you said that. That was beautifully said. Um, I, I really appreciate that idea of showing compassion to the family and respect this, as you would show to any family, but really um, thinking about that because you don't really know what's gone on before. We, we come in and we're, we're seeing a snapshot of their time. Um, it looks like Millie was, Millie and Alexis were thinking right along the same lines as you, Joe Shalon, letting the families know, kind of letting them know where we fit and where we don't with social services, that we're a different kind of service and how we're here to, to show support. Um, Alexis brings in that services are voluntary. 
and, and they are voluntary. They, they do still have a choice, but within the system, if they have been referred and it's a requirement mm -hmm. as part of their, you know, keeping their check, keeping the custody of their child. I like what you said about acknowledging this, like just putting it out and on the table so that everybody knows where we stand and, and you can help the family have the information to make that informed decision. It looks like, um, let's see, yeah, Alexis talking about how it is really hard to be in this situation. It's hard for families to trust in these situations. I remember a family I worked with years ago and I took a long time for us to get out there. And when I went out, um, it took a long time for the family to feel comfortable letting us come. And when I came, I went out there, I learned that the mother said she was real, the father was actually really afraid of letting me come to the home because he didn't know if I would see something like their closets were dirty and take mm -hmm. their children away. And I was like, that is really not my role. Like the anxiety they must have been feeling with having me come out must have been tremendous. And I really wanted to do just the things you guys have talked about, build that partnership, help them understand my role and know that we're there to work together. But you also made that great point. Here's where I stand as a mandated reporter, but my mm -hmm. intention is here to support you. So I love it that you put that in here. I also Thank wanted you. to point your attention to Robin's um, information here about New Path. Robin, I love it that you put that in there. And Robin, I was thinking, would you mind putting the link to the New Path um, information in case folks aren't familiar with New Path and what they do with families? Um, she's got some information there. Maybe we can add that link. So go ahead, Joshua. And I wanted to say too, and you know, this is where um, it's important for, you know, for culture, you know, to come in. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, cultural diversity yes. um, and things like that, but it's also important, you know, when you're working with families, um, you know, that have these challenges, you know, with CPS and things like that, we have to think about like the culture. And so, um, you know, sometimes as, and not just African-Americans, but the history of African-Americans and, you know, when social workers, you know, came into your community, you knew that something like that was, that was something that was going to happen, you yeah. know, that your child um, may be taken from the homes. So you think about like some of those in different, you know, areas in our you know, here in Norfolk, we have a large population of, you know, like low income families that we yeah. serve. And so you just kind of think about the history of it. And so I think being sensitive to that, um, you know, that's important and having those relationships because sometimes people kind of, you know, unfortunately, you know, people group people together. And yes. so, you know, even regardless of whether I'm an African-American woman going into an African-American neighborhood, I'm still kind of grouped together as a social worker or grouped together right. as human services. And so I think it's important to understand the culture, to understand the, um, the neighborhood that you're going into, you know, and you kind of just think about it. Because, you know, sometimes we have families that live in, you know, upper class neighborhoods. And here we are driving in with our little city car, you know, <laughs> with like city of whatever on yeah. there. And then you kind of think about, how their neighbors think about like, what are they doing? What's happening? And we're coming to do a service. So I think it's important to think about culture and think about diversity as we're working with families, you know, in general, but sometimes yeah. really in these challenging situations. Yeah. Um, you that know, could be a whole nother SC chat, I think, Joe, is yes. <laughs> the cultural and the um, the, and Lisa even brings in here about the traumatic experiences, generational trauma, like there's a lot mm -hmm. to be thinking about the family experience and what they bring to the table, which reminds me, when you and I talked, you mentioned the idea of, we were talking this one through about meeting families where they are. And we talked about that. I thought that's a phrase that is so used in early intervention, often to the point sometimes that we say it, but I don't know what it means, or it doesn't have mm -hmm. enough meaning, or it means something different for all of us. So I would love for you to share what you think that means in the context of working with families, probably all families, but especially when we see families that maybe have those traumatic experiences or in those challenging situations. So I use that a lot. <laughs> and I think I've used it a lot, um, you know, over the years of being a service coordinator, meeting families where they are. And I think it's when we're talking about meeting families where they are, it's important to find out what's important to them and not pushing our will on them. Yeah. Right? We are, you know, if you're in early intervention, you know, in this helping field, you're not doing it because of money, you know, you're not doing it because of like status or titles, 
really to be in this field, you have to be, you have to do it because of the love, you know, the love of people, the love of really wanting to do this. And so sometimes, you know, because we're so knowledgeable about like early childhood development, we're so knowledgeable about early intervention. Sometimes what we want for the family, we tend to push it on them. Um, But we have to meet them where they are. Every family that comes into early intervention, they're not ready to hear about certain diagnoses. They're not ready to go to developmental peds. They're not ready to hear that their child may need, you know, lifelong services. And so sometimes we just want to give so much information and we want them to do what we think is best for them. And I think we have to stop and we have to say, where is this family? what are they ready for? And not even, sometimes we even think we know, you know, when we need to stop or what they're ready for, but really being able to have that conversation. How do you feel about this? How much information do you have? How much information do you want? How much do you need? Um, How many services do you, you know, we want? I'm glad that we've gone to primary provider in Virginia because, you know, we used to be, you know, there was OTPT speech, you know, the, the family had everything, and, you know, now we're able to stop and say, yes, this family could definitely benefit from OT and PT, but is that too much for them? How much are they ready for? And so I think meeting them where they are is, again, allowing them to drive the bus, let them know what their options are, let them know what their options are for services, but really giving them the opportunity to choose as long as it's appropriate, because we also have to make sure that we're doing what's appropriate but not overwhelming them yeah, and not pushing them to do more of what we want because we think it's best, but really allowing them to, you know, we, we go through all the, we go through all the rules and regulations, right? We go through all their rights and we tell them you have the right to do A, B, and C, but then when it's time to make the decision, we're like pushing everything on them. You yeah. have to be true to what the rights booklet says is that you have the right um, and so we have to meet them where they are and we have to go, we have to take one step at a time with them to get, help them get where they need to be, but meeting them where they are and not pushing what we want on the family. So that's what it means to me yeah. and kind of putting what I think is best on the back burner and, and being really true, allowing them to be true to who they, to who they are and what they need. Yeah, I, I really like the way you explained that. And it's like a mindful process, right? To be aware of your your motives and sometimes biases, all that can play in there, but to check yourself and remember who's driving the bus, like you said, awesome. There's a couple comments in chat. Thank you, Robin, for adding that link. Um, Alexis says that's why she loves to visit priorities, resources, and concerns before the um, the team joins her for the assessment so she can touch base with the family on where they are going forward. And she says another good point, Joe, is make, making sure the family's comfortable and can meet, can meet what is suggested for the plan. Ask them, is this something you guys are available for? Do you think you can meet this often? Will you be able to get off work? So yeah, when you're having that discussion about services and determining services, and frequency and you know whether you are going to have one person working with the family or maybe more than one person working with the family how is this going to work for them I think that's all part of respecting where they are and what they bring to the table so thanks thanks for adding that in there Alexis well I am watching our time we've got about eight minutes left so as we start to wind down I wanted to ask Joshlan if there's any other pieces of advice you would share say with new service coordinators about building those relationships. And I would love for folks to type into chat, what is your bit of advice? If you were thinking about, if you were gonna train a new service coordinator or collaborate with a peer who's new, what might be a piece of advice you give them about building these, uh, these early relationships? So Joshlan, what would, what would you wrap us up with? So the most important thing to me um, that I would tell a new service coordinator is be yourself. There is, um, don't be so professional that families can't connect with you. Okay. Now, and, right, I'm definitely not saying not to be professional. We absolutely have to be professional. We absolutely have to have boundaries. It's very important because being in this field, you know, it's, it's easy to go outside of your boundaries. You know, if you love people, if you love families, if you love babies and you want the best for everybody. But I always tell my families, what you see 
is what you get. I'm always going to be professional, but I'm always going to be myself because I can't be anyone else. It's hard trying to be someone else. And I don't want to use my energy. I don't want to work that hard. Um, I live in Norfolk. I work in Norfolk. I play in Norfolk. And yeah. so, I, you know, I let my families know, you may see me out at Walmart. You may see me, you know, you may see me any place. You may see me at the movies. You're going to see me out and about because as my son says, this is my city. Um, you know, this is where I live. And yeah. I tell my families, I will never approach you because you have to have your privacy. But if we're in the store and you see me and you want to speak to me, that's fine. I'm not going to talk to you about your therapy in the middle of Walmart. We're not going to do that. That's going to be a boundary that we have. But if you see me and you speak to me, I'm going to speak back. But the same person you see at your house, the same family you see um, you know, at our office is going to be the same family, the same person that you see in Walmart. And it's because I'm going to be professional, but families need to know that you're being yourself. And so that is the advice that I will give, you know, a seasoned service coordinator, you know, definitely a new service coordinator, be yourself, but always be professional. And you're going to build, you're going to be able to build that relationship with families so much better, so much quicker. And it's going to be genuine because of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what you, we want the families to feel comfortably genuine with us. So I love the idea of bringing that into your relationships. And I think Marty sums us up nicely for us. Leave your judgy pants at the door, right? Absolutely. I love that, Marty. <laughs> We've got a couple of other comments here. Lots of folks were agreeing with you, um, Joe, as you were talking. We have listen more than talk. Um, Let's see, we have allow the family to talk about how they're feeling with what's going on so they can process what they've learned about their child. It's a great point. Um, taking good notes about all from all conversations so you can refer back to them with previous with future conversations. Um, asking the family, for example, how their vacation was, follow up with the appointments they had. So kind of getting respecting and getting that big picture of the family. And Angelina says, good advice, I would say, is that it's okay not to know all the answers. Yeah, there are always unique situations that would come up. Joy asks, that's funny, Joy, you're not an octopus. Be present, but do your best with what you have in front of you to give your best one family at a time. I love it Absolutely. what you said earlier, Joe, about that for this hour, that family deserves your total attention. So I think that's similar what Joy was saying there. Let's see, um, Marty, of course, says we need um, slogans about leaving your, your uh, t-shirt about leaving your judgy pants at the door. And Alexis says, really great advice. I'm going to borrow that statement as I live, work, and play in the same place, too. I think it's a great way, yeah, to sort of show what you share in your, in your neighborhood. Lots and lots of good things in here. Um, let's see, Melinda says, I try to remember to end visits with two stars and a wish. So in other words, two positive things observed during the visit and something the family may want to work on. Many parents hear about the needs, but they, ne they need to hear the positives, too. Yeah, so LaShonda says, empathy and compassion are necessary in your role. Um, Lisa is following up with a phone call after the ASP. Lots of really good stuff happening in the chat. So thank you guys for adding to the conversation there and for Joe Schwann for sharing your, um, your piece of advice about being yourself. I'm gonna wrap us up with just a couple minutes to go. Here's um, our email addresses. If you wanna reach out to Joe Schwann and me, feel free to do that. Um, for me, if you have feedback about today or you have any, um, any thoughts about a future topic, or maybe you're a service coordinator that would like to join us for a, a service coordination chat on a talk, topic like Joe did today, we would love to do that and hear more directly from service coordinators. Lisa's also popped into chat our social media links in case you are on, you know, active on any of them and you want to follow us. We would love to have, us, have you join us there. And then I am going to just give you a little bit of a piece of advice. Before I do that, though, I do want to thank you, Joe Shalon, for taking the time to meet with me, to develop this, and for sharing what you know today. I think it's been super valuable. And I think there's a lot of excitement in the chat about what you've shared. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. I love early intervention. I love what we do to support families. I do got to shout out my Norfolk crew because they showed up for me today. And LaShonda, she's my ex Norfolk crew. But um, I just, I think, I mean, what we do is so important. Um, and sometimes I know as service coordinators, sometimes we feel like we're at the bottom, um, you know, of kind of like the totem pole. But I want you to know today that our um, our roles are so important 
and we really do set the tone, um, you know, for the entire program and we do good work. So service coordinators, keep doing what you're doing. Um, we're supporting families and this has really been awesome. So it thank you all awesome. so much for coming today. Yes, definitely. Uh, Sue Ann says, thanks so much. Good for newbies too. Awesome. Every one of us was a newbie at one time. So I want you guys to stay tuned. We'll have more service coordination chats in 2022. It's hard to believe we're actually talking about what's going to happen next year, 2022. But we would love your input and ideas for our next service coordination chat. So let us know. You're also going to have, it's probably already in your inbox, a link to a, a feedback survey. So please take a few minutes and give us some feedback about today's session. There's also a place in that feedback survey to let us know if you have ideas for topics or you're interested in, um, you know, talking to hearing more about a particular topic in the future. Once you complete the survey, then you will have an access to your certificate of completion, which um, is just linked at the end of the survey. You, um, if any, if somebody, anybody, um, uh, registered one person but had multiple people join you, just forward that email to others and they can provide feedback. Um, know that you need to download the certificate when you see it. Download it to your computer and then save it. And then that's when the, the timestamp or the date stamp will update. If you have any questions about the certificate, about future SC chats, anything at all, my email is there. You, you know how to reach me, so feel free to reach out. So I agree, Stacy. it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you guys for being a part of it and chatting again. Thank you, Joe Shalon, and thanks Norfolk for letting us borrow Joe for the morning. I appreciate it, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Great, right, Joe, again, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting and we can touch base again another time. All right, thank you so much. Have Bye, a great you guys. day. Bye. Good job. Bye.